Thank you for sticking around. This very day last year, I was returning from two weeks in India. And I was part of a delegation that had gone out researching the theme of future cities. But I was particularly interested to see how indigenous Indian belief systems and culture impacted on their view of what the future city would be. The city I visited was Amamabad. And the thing that really stood out as we ventured into the city was that it was teeming with life. It was an urban jungle. Everywhere you looked, there was domesticated species, semi-domesticated, indigenous, migratory, quite possibly invasive. The domesticated animals, of course, included the cow. India is famous for its uh, worship of the cow walking down the streets, about certain buildings, in the roadways, with the traffic, against the traffic. But there were many other domesticated species, horses, camels, you name it, it was, it was uh, walking about. Wild species, monkeys, palm squirrels. There are over 160 species of birds in the city. And it was an incredible experience because, of course, although here in London and other cities of the world, there's certainly urban wildlife, there it is in such richness, in such diversity, it's so very prevalent that you experience it in, in a different way. It's not subtle as such. It's, it's part of your experience of the city. It's something that you're persistently conscious of. Now... What struck me about this, and this was something that I was really hoping to find, was that this was not accidental. It was not accidental that this was a biodiversity-rich city. And there were various ways in which the factors that led to this biodiversity, or if you like, underpinned it, enabled the resilience of the species, expressed itself. One of them, if you walked out early in the city, you noticed that the local inhabitants, regardless of district, the poorest communities, middle class, the wealthier communities, put out food for the animals. The roads, the pathways were scattered in bird seed. There were greens, vegetables, remnants from the kitchen, other bits and pieces that were put out for the cattle. Just here, I'm not sure if you can make it out, but Amamabad is a very arid city, it's very dry. People leave out water bowls, and at all heights for the various different animals. There were low bowls for the dogs, high for the cattle, etc. And in this assemblage here, we have literally several water uh, vessels that have been placed out to ensure that the, the animals are able to sustain themselves in, in the heat uh, of summer. And of course, in Indian culture and belief systems, animals are expressed in many ways, they are revered as gods, deities. And this really echoes down through the ages. And this was something that stood out, because this, of course, is something that is almost lost in Western culture. If you walk about London, while historically we revered biodiversity, today this is not, this is not part of our culture. You don't find Londoners, as a rule, putting food out, putting water out on the streets for animals. You do find some good-willed persons who might, for example, put a bird feeder in the garden or they might do something. But on the whole, this is not inherent and something that we're all doing. But it was actually architecturally that I saw, thought something very interesting was going on. And this is really coming back to the idea of what is progress? What, what should our vision, what should our aspiration for the future city be? Often, you are told that it is the vision of science fiction. It is that sterile, that high-density, skyscraper-laden city. But what I saw in Amamabad made me question that. Here you've got a couple of pictures that I put together that I took about the old town. And the old architecture, to be honest, it looks rather ramshackled now. But bear in mind that some of the structures pictured here are a few hundred years old. 
and also bear in mind that this, this city is hit not by um, the odd natural disaster, the, the odd hazard. It faces annual monsoons where the waters can be so high. It faces a number of earthquakes, high magnitude earthquakes. In 2001, it had a, a really, really large earthquake um, of the sort we're, we're now becoming more conscious of. Of course, earthquakes and natural disasters are nothing new, but thanks to media, uh, we're, now, we're you know, now a little bit more aware of these things. So these buildings have been through that. They've been through numerous earthquakes. They've been through annual floods, droughts, and, and conditions that can really push buildings to their limits. So it's, it's understandable that they look a little ramshackled. But that aside... What you see here are some really effective solutions, and that these are very social architectures. Architectures that enable people to communicate, that enable balconies, verandas, windows that open, that enable people to communicate with those, with their neighbours, with those on the street. And that also, if you like, as a side effect, create a safe harbour for animals. Another of the things that you notice about this city and about other Indian cities is that they like to put out bird feeders. So the balconies are strewn with bird feeders. There are lots of nooks and crannies, eaves and so forth for birds to nest in and for small mammals, for insects. So these architectures, if you like, encourage support, biodiversity. They allow for it. Here in the middle, you see a facade. I'm not kidding when I say that I was walking down a street where we had lots and lots of buildings that were old, that were historical, and then slap bang in the middle was this, what I call a monstrosity. It was a modern facade. I'd say probably in the region of just several years old. And this stood out as stark contrast. It really, if you like to me, epitomized the future city vision in that this exterior here has nowhere really for animals to nest, to even perch. The only place a bird could land is on the roof. But not only that, this isn't just obnoxious to animals. This is socially obnoxious. The people in here, these were mirrored, mirrored windows. You couldn't even see the people inside this building, let alone have a conversation with them. So it acted like a barrier. It acted like a facade that kept the people inside remote from the people outside. And that seemed very symbolic to me. Thankfully, they have a few measures put in place so that uh, monstrosities like that don't become uh, a common occurrence in the city. But I felt that this really challenged the notion of progress. What is progress? Is progress the shiny, the new, the sterile? Or is progress, in fact, to be found in historic architectures? And not necessarily through planned procedures, but through accident. Now, you might ask yourself... Why does it matter uh, if we accommodate for biodiversity or otherwise? Why, why is this important? Well, let's think about how we think of the city. We tend to think of nature as being over there, the rural areas, and cities as being something different. That is a completely synthetic perspective, an anthropogenic 20, 21st century perspective that is completely and utterly out of touch with reality. Why is that? Well, of course, cities are biomes in themselves. They support life. They support us. But there are many, many other species that, of course, inhabit cities. And not just, as I was saying, not just the indigenous species, not just the domestic species, not just the species that we decide to be there, but migratory species. If you consider some of the statistics that are presently knocking around as to how much of the world will become urbanized, how many more cities are being built? If you're thinking about a place like China, where literally dozens of cities are being planned, it starts to become very, very important as to whether or not your cities can accommodate for nature. And you might also say, well, hang on a minute, because I've seen lots of developers' plans that do accommodate for nature, that have green spaces, that have a green way, that maybe have a green roof, a vertical garden, and so on. But then think in a little bit more detail, because, again, you're thinking anthropogenically here. And I'm going to give you the example of the urban forest. There have been a few projects of late that have 
referred to buildings that place trees on balconies and on roofs as being urban forests. But let's actually think of this ecologically. What is a forest? Is it a collection of trees? Is that all it is? No. A forest is a complex ecosystem, comprised many symbiotic relationships. What is going on below the soil? The root networks of the trees, the soil hydrology, the species inherent therein are, as roots imply, the foundations of the forest. You don't create a resilient forest where you have a somewhat superficial surface below. You create a resilient forest where you accommodate for that complexity, where you consider what is required to make those rich foundations. Is a balcony that's maybe got, what about that much depth for the soil? Is that an appropriate infrastructure for an urban forest. Is a tree that is placed on, an, on a balcony or on a roof alone, isolated, where it is disconnected from the rest of the trees that supposedly comprise that urban forest? Is that, is that really a forest? No. In, in my opinion, that is just the lipstick, if you like, as my colleague, uh, Dr. Well, now Professor Rachel Armstrong, calls it the lipstick on the gorilla. It's a really superficial approach. So when we think about urban ecology, when we think about how we accommodate for species, we've got a couple of things coming into play here. The first thing that we've really got to do is we've got to bring in ecologists. We've got to bring in the people that actually understand nature, not just, as I said, what is going on in our locality, but those people who are, who are working with nature, working with natural systems worldwide. We've got to listen to what they have to say. We've got to listen and understand how these systems are working. So that's one thing. But of course, we've also got to work with people, with citizens, citizens on the street, because it really doesn't matter what ideas we come up with, how radical our new approaches to architectures are, how inclusive they are. If citizens and if businesses are not going to adopt these things, well, you know, we might as well be we might as well be doing something else that is actually going to make an impact. And that really brings me to another aspect of the time that I spent in India. Myself and a colleague went out to our citizens. What do you want in your future city? What's important to you? What would you like to see your grandchildren experience as the future city? And there were a few things that came up. There was, uh, there was the concerns about water. People wanted clean water. They wanted clean air. These were things that they felt were being stripped away from them. They wanted space. They felt that availability of space, availability of land, of housing was becoming scant. So the, these were very prominent issues. Education came up highly. But of all these things and others, the number one thing that people referred to was flora and fauna, be it in the generic sense that they wanted the rich wildlife, the urban jungle, to persist about them, or specific species. Invariably, when people refer to a specific species, they had an anecdote. So, for example, they say, um, I want the future city to, uh, to comprise, you know, to, to feature dogs, because dogs are very abundant in cities, and people have uh, relationships with these dogs. They you know, they're part of their daily life. They're not just strays as such. They're looked after by the community. People appreciate uh, that species within their urban arena. But it was the number one thing, and yet it wasn't accommodated for in really any of the development plans. It's rarely talked about in future city proposals. The fact that people have a connection to nature. Of course, now we're becoming more aware of biophilia. But this was the number one thing at the citizen level. So we have a citizen need. Arguably, if you've looked at the rates of biodiversity loss worldwide, for example, we've lost 50% of species this past 40 or so years. There is, a, there is an actual need to do this. But there's something else about this that I, having trained as a designer, think is particularly exciting. This is something I believe we can do. I believe that we can create cities, we can create architectures that are more accommodating of biodiversity, where allowing for flora and fauna, it's not just an add-on, it's not just, oh, well, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll pop a bit of greenery 
on this development, but we actually, as architects, as designers, as planners, as persons whom are commissioning properties, as persons whom are influencing what gets built and what doesn't, indeed investors that fund developments, we make it a challenge, we make it a value that our architectures are not just socially inclusive, they are ecologically, they are biologically inclusive. I think there is a need for it. I think there is a potential impact to be made. And I honestly think that if the great figures that shaped contemporary architecture were here with us today, if the likes of Leonardo da Vinci, Bruno Lasky, Alberti, through to the modernists, the likes of Le Corbusier, the Frank Lloyd Wrights, look at their writings, look at what they were about. They weren't about making great buildings per se. They weren't about making great works even. They were about solving problems. They were about taking on challenges. I think that they would be working on this today. I really hope that this is something that has captured your imagination. This is very raw. raw. This is the first time I've spoken about, spoken about this in public. So it's still an idea that is still coming together. But I think it's something that has some potential. So I hope that that idea has captured your imagination and that it will be something that you'll be thinking about in the coming weeks and months and years. Thank you.